Gospel according to Matthew is found in the 15th chapter. Lord, Lord, Lord. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting at us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Decisions. Decisions, decisions, decisions. We face them every day. They range from what to have for breakfast to whether or not we should change jobs or get married. So we all make decisions on a daily basis. Some good, some not so good. In the church, the decision-making process is often called discernment. Discernment is the word we hear over and over again and over and over and over and over again when we are considering entering the ministry or when congregations are searching for a new pastor. I'm sure that your call committee heard the word discernment one or more times or when any group or person needs to find a new direction in life. One of my favorite online authors, Sarah Dillon Brewer, believes that there are three common factors that get in the way of discernment. The first is the conviction that you already know what God wants. You are in tune with God's will and fully aware of God's desires. This conviction can stop the discernment process before it even has a chance to begin. I mean, why bother if you're already fully aware of God's will on the subject? The second factor is the belief that there's a person or group that you don't need to listen to because they po couldn't possibly have anything of value to contribute. Just think about how often as adults we plan Sunday school curriculum and we never ask the children what they might be interested in, even if the children are old enough to have some, some input in the decision making. Or think of how many times a wedding is planned by the bride and her mother and no one ever asks the groom what he would like to see happen. Well, finally, there's the conviction that if you knew what God was up to before, no further discernment is necessary. This is a big favorite of mine because it's the trap that church leaders fall into most often. Changing course implies that your first course might have been a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes, and if you want to be seen as a trustworthy church leader, you don't want anyone to think you've made a mistake either. So you never change course. These temptations are particularly strong for leaders who feel in their heart of hearts that authority comes from knowing a lot more than everyone else in the community, and who also believe that they don't really know enough to justify being in a position of leadership. This means that any change in direction will cause a loss of face and confirm what people probably already suspect. You're not Jesus. But how does that picture we have of the ideal, unwavering church leader, the one who doesn't need to grow because she or he is already a spiritual giant, the one who treats engaging with other points of view as a sign of undesirable weakness, how does that picture match the picture of Jesus we find in Scripture? Well, if today's gospel is any indication, it doesn't. Today, Jesus is confronted by a woman who calls out to him, demanding his help. It's not surprising that Jesus doesn't answer her at first. His culture is what's called an honor-shame culture. In his culture, answering someone who confronts you like that would be seen as an admission that the challenger was at least an equal. If Jesus responds to the woman, that's what everyone watching will think that Jesus is no better than she is. The exception would be if she appealed to him in the proper way, 
perhaps as a subject to a king. Her address to him as son of David might suggest she's taking that approach, if she were an Israelite. This might be what she had in mind when she cried out, maybe she hoped to pass as a Jew. But Jesus' reply makes it clear that even if he is a king, he's not her king. Jesus actually takes away his one faith-saving excuse for what's about to happen, because what's about to happen is that Jesus is going to give in. And by answering, Jesus makes her his equal in the eyes of the crowd. And then, after acknowledging that she's not an Israelite, Jesus gives in. He loses the argument. He changes course at a woman's word and commends her for challenging him. Now, I've heard people say that Jesus didn't really mean it when he called her a dog. That he knew precisely what he was doing, and he was testing the woman's faith to see whether she was worthy of the miraculous healing she requested for her daughter. But I don't buy it. For one thing, this is not how the crowd who witnessed the event or the readers of Matthew's Gospel would have interpreted what happened. I also do not believe that Jesus would play mind games with a woman desperately seeking a cure for her daughter just to score points in the honor-shame society of his culture. I believe that Jesus was changed by his encounter with this woman. He chose to listen to someone who would have been ignored by others. He chose to listen to someone who, and to act with compassion. He chose to listen and to heal and to change his mind, even though doing so cost him honor in the sight of others. This demonstrates to us how a true leader discerns mission. The kind of discernment that we, that all of us, are called to exercise is not about certainty, especially not when certainty threatens to trump compassion. Discernment is also isn't about knowing who not to listen to. The wisdom of Jesus' time held that someone who took counsel from a strange woman, a Canaanite woman, a woman who shouted out in the marketplace, well, this was not a good woman to take advice from. And yet Jesus is still open to hearing the wisdom of the Canaanite woman. Finally, and this is vital once we've discerned a genuine call, this does not mean that it's what we're called to do at all times and under all circumstances let alone that it's a call for all of humanity. Jesus meant it when he said that he was called to the Jews, to the lost sheep of Israel. But Jesus had a deeper sense of call, a deeper sense of what it would mean for him to be faithful, and that included entering into genuine relationship with others. That's what love means. And relationship, loving relationship, changes everyone involved. The changeability of God is present in our reading from Isaiah, even if it's somewhat hidden by leading out verses 2 through 5. In those verses, we learn that the foreigner will be welcome in the house of the Lord, that those who have been excluded will in be included. We also hear that eunuchs who are considered non-persons in Jewish society will be welcomed. They will be given a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. All of these and more, God says, I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Jesus sent his disciples to the house of Israel, where he said he was called to gather lost sheep. And then a pushy Canaanite woman revealed something more, something that led the risen Jesus to commission Paul as an apostle to the Gentiles. Just when we thought we'd seen the limits of God's love, that love can grow. Thanks be to God.